Today, we're talking about invaders that have been wreaking havoc across the United States. No, not the kind of invaders you see in action movies or the ones that make you worry about locking your doors at night. These are invasive species. These sneaky creatures and plants have infiltrated our ecosystems, taking over habitats and displacing native species in the process. Think of them as the uninvited guests at a party who not only overstay their welcome, but also eat all the food and make a mess. From aquatic acrobats that leap through the air to plants that grow faster than rumors at a small town barbecue, these invaders have caused more than a few headaches for environmentalists, wildlife managers, and everyday Americans alike. And as you'll soon see, the methods used to control them are as varied and creative as the problems they've caused. First on our list is the Asian carp, a group of fish species that have made themselves quite at home in American waterways. They were originally imported to help fish farms and wastewater treatment plants by eating excess algae and plankton. It seemed like a good idea at the time, but Mother Nature had other plans. In the 1970s, flooding allowed these carp to escape into the Mississippi River Basin, and they have since spread throughout the Midwest like an unstoppable aquatic plague. What makes Asian carp so problematic? For starters, they reproduce like rabbits, with females laying up to a million eggs per year. They consume vast amounts of plankton, the same food that native fish rely on, effectively starving out other species. And let's not forget their most famous trick, leaping out of the water when startled. Boaters navigating carp-infested waters have been pelted by these flying fish, which can weigh up to 100 pounds. It's not just an inconvenience, it's a safety hazard. Imagine cruising along, enjoying a day on the river, only to get smacked in the face by a 30-pound fish. So, how is the U.S. combating these aquatic acrobats? One of the most innovative solutions has been the use of electric barriers. These barriers are installed in waterways to create electric fences that prevent the carp from advancing. The shock is harmless to humans and most other wildlife, but enough to deter the carp. It's a bit like setting up an electric boundary in your yard to keep your dog from escaping, but on a much larger scale. It's an expensive and complex operation, but the stakes are high. If Asian carp reach the Great Lakes, they could devastate the multi-billion dollar fishing and tourism industries. Alongside electric barriers, government agencies are also experimenting with other methods, such as using sound and bubble curtains to create additional deterrence. Efforts are ongoing, and scientists continue to explore ways to outsmart these formidable fish. Next up, let's dive into the wild world of wild boars. These aren't your cute, pink, curly-tailed farm pigs. Wild boars are muscular, aggressive, and can grow up to 400 pounds. They were brought to North America centuries ago by early European settlers for sport hunting and livestock purposes. Over time, some of these pigs escaped or were released into the wild, where they interbred with domestic pigs, creating a hybrid super pig that's even harder to manage. These destructive beasts are a nightmare for farmers and landowners. They root up fields and pastures in search of food, leaving behind a wake of destruction they don't discriminate, tearing through crops, forest floors, and even damaging delicate wetlands. To make matters worse, wild boars carry diseases that can be transmitted to livestock, pets, and even humans. The economic toll of wild boar damage is estimated to be in the billions, and their populations continue to grow, spreading into new territories across the southern United States and beyond. How do we deal with these rampaging hogs? Hunting is one of the primary methods of control. States like Texas have taken things a step further, organizing wild boar hunting festivals and offering bounties for each hog taken down. In some places, it's become a cultural event, with hunters coming together to see who can bag the most boars. Specialized helicopters and thermal imaging technology are even used for aerial hunting, turning the Texas countryside into a boar battleground. Trapping is another common method, using large baited cages to capture entire sounders, groups of wild boars at once. While these efforts have helped, wild boars are cunning and adaptable, making complete eradication nearly impossible. Now let's discuss a plant that has become synonymous with the phrase taking over, kudzu. This invasive vine was brought from Japan to the United States in the late 1800s to help with erosion control, but it quickly became a botanical monster. Kudzu grows at a mind-boggling rate of up to a foot per day, smothering trees, power lines, and even abandoned buildings. It's as if someone hit the fast-forward button on plant growth and there's no pause in sight. Kudzu now covers millions of acres across the southeastern United States, transforming once-diverse landscapes into green deserts. What makes kudzu so difficult to control? It has an extensive root system that can store energy for years, meaning that even if you cut it down to the ground, it's likely to come back. Herbicides can work but need to be applied repeatedly, making chemical control expensive and environmentally questionable. Enter the unlikely heroes in this battle. 
Goats. Yes, goats. These furry four-legged lawnmowers are rented out to munch down kudzu in places where machinery can't reach. It's an eco-friendly solution that's as effective as it is adorable. Goat rental companies have sprung up across the South, and some urban areas have even used goats to clear invasive plants from city parks. It's a case of fighting nature with nature, and while goats can't eradicate kudzu entirely, they're a valuable part of the toolkit. Brace yourself for something slimy, the giant African snail. These enormous mollusks, which can grow up to eight inches long, are a gardener's worst nightmare. They eat hundreds of plant species, including vegetables, fruits, and even the bark of trees. And if that weren't bad enough, they can carry a parasite that causes meningitis in humans. It's no wonder that states like Florida, where the snails have invaded, have declared them a significant threat to agriculture and public health. How do you stop a giant, slime-trailing snail invasion? The U.S. has implemented strict quarantine measures, restricting the movement of soil and plant materials from infested areas. But perhaps the most surprising weapon in this battle is the use of specially trained dogs. These snail-sniffing dogs are trained to detect the scent of giant African snails and help their handlers track them down. It's like a high-stakes game of hide-and-seek, and the dogs are remarkably good at their jobs. In some cases, entire neighborhoods have been put under surveillance, with residents asked to report any slimy suspects. Teams of inspectors regularly comb through yards searching for snails that might be lurking in the shadows. Public education is also crucial. Residents in affected areas are advised on how to recognize the snails and what to do if they find one. The fight against these mollusks is ongoing, but thanks to a combination of canine detectives, human vigilance, and strict regulations, the situation is gradually being brought under control. Next up, we head to the Florida Everglades, a unique and fragile ecosystem that has become ground zero in the battle against Burmese pythons. These snakes, which can grow to over 20 feet long and weigh more than 200 pounds, have established a breeding population in the Everglades after being released or escaping from captivity. As apex predators, they've wreaked havoc on native wildlife, gobbling up everything from small mammals to wading birds and even the occasional alligator. The scale of the problem is enormous. The python population in the Everglades is estimated to be in the tens of thousands, and traditional methods of snake control are insufficient. To combat this slithering menace, Florida hosts annual python hunting competitions, drawing participants from all over the country. These hunters, armed with snake hooks, machetes, and a lot of courage, comb the wetlands in search of their quarry. The contests offer cash prizes for the most pythons captured or the largest snake caught, turning the fight into a community event that raises awareness while removing hundreds of snakes from the ecosystem. But hunting alone isn't enough. Researchers are developing more advanced techniques, such as using radio tag Judas snakes to track down python nests. These tagged snakes unknowingly lead scientists to breeding areas where entire clutches of eggs can be destroyed before they hatch. There are also experiments with using drone technology to detect pythons from the air. Despite these efforts, the battle is far from over. The Everglades remain a battleground, and the future of its native species hangs in the balance. Zebra mussels, small but mighty troublemakers, have wreaked havoc in the Great Lakes region and beyond. Originally from Eastern Europe, they were accidentally introduced to North America in the ballast water of ships. These mussels reproduce rapidly, attaching themselves to almost any hard surface. They clog water intake pipes, damage boats, and disrupt entire aquatic ecosystems by filtering out plankton, which native species need to survive. The economic impact of zebra mussels is staggering, costing billions in maintenance and control efforts. Boaters are now required to take precautions to prevent the spread of these tiny terrors. This includes cleaning and draining their vessels before moving to different bodies of water. In addition to these measures, scientists are exploring new methods of control, such as using bacteria that are deadly to zebra mussels but harmless to other species. While these efforts have helped slow their spread, zebra mussels remain a persistent and costly problem. Public awareness campaigns have played a critical role in managing the invasion. Billboards and posters remind people to stop aquatic hitchhikers and educate the public about the importance of vigilance. Despite these efforts, zebra mussels continue to spread and new infestations are reported regularly. The fight against these invaders is a marathon, not a sprint, and every small victory counts. The spotted lanternfly, a recent but severe invader, has spread rapidly in the northeastern United States. 
These colorful insects are beautiful but deadly to agriculture, feeding on the sap of over 70 different plant species, including grapevines, fruit trees, and hardwoods. They leave behind a sticky residue called honeydew, which promotes the growth of sooty mold and damages plants. To combat this invasive pest, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has launched an all-out war. Residents in affected areas are encouraged to stomp on lantern flies and check their vehicles and outdoor gear for egg masses before traveling. Community efforts have included organizing lantern fly smash events to engage the public. Sticky bands wrapped around tree trunks trap the insects, though these bands must be used carefully to avoid harming other wildlife. Insecticides are another line of defense, but the problem persists. Scientists are even looking into introducing natural predators, such as parasitic wasps, to help control lanternfly populations. Despite these efforts, the spotted lanternfly continues to spread, and it's a race against time to protect the region's valuable crops and forests. The battle is far from over, but the coordinated efforts of scientists, government agencies, and everyday citizens give hope for a solution. Cane toads are one of the more infamous invasive species, especially in Florida. Introduced from Central and South America, to control sugarcane pests, these amphibians have become a toxic menace. Their skin secretes a potent toxin that can kill pets and poison native predators. Dogs, for example, are particularly vulnerable to the toxin if they bite or sniff a cane toad. Imagine your beloved pet going from a playful sniff to a life-threatening emergency. Controlling cane toads is no small feat. Community toad patrols have been organized where volunteers use flashlights to capture and humanely euthanize these amphibians. Toad-proof fences have been installed around sensitive habitats to keep them out. Some researchers are experimenting with pheromone traps to lure the toads into enclosures where they can be removed. Public education is also vital, as awareness helps reduce the accidental spread of these toxic travelers. The fight continues, but progress is being made. Nutria large semi-aquatic rodents are also known as swamp rats for good reason. Brought to the U.S. in the early 20th century for the fur trade, they escaped captivity and have since caused significant damage to wetlands, especially in Louisiana. Nutria burrow into levees and riverbanks, weakening critical infrastructure and accelerating erosion. Their insatiable appetite for wetland vegetation has turned once thriving marshes into barren mudflats. Efforts to control Nutria populations include organized trapping and bounty programs. Louisiana offers payments for each Nutria tail turned in, motivating locals to hunt these wetland wreckers. Some chefs have even promoted Nutria meat as a sustainable food source, turning an invasive problem into an unusual culinary opportunity. However, Nutria continue to reproduce quickly and eradicating them entirely seems unlikely. Creative and sustained efforts are essential to protect America's wetlands from further destruction caused by these voracious rodents. Anyone who's ever stepped on a fire ant mound knows how painful their stings can be. These aggressive ants, native to South America, have spread across the southern United States, attacking anything that disturbs their nests. Their venom causes burning, itchy welts, and can even trigger severe allergic reactions in some people. Fire ants also damage crops and pose a threat to livestock, making them a major agricultural pest. Control methods include spreading bait traps and applying insecticides to known mounds. In some areas, biological control methods are being used, like introducing parasitic forward flies. These flies lay their eggs on the ants, and when the larvae hatch, they decapitate their host. It's a gruesome but effective strategy that's right out of a horror movie. Keeping fire ant populations in check is a constant challenge, and homeowners are advised to remain vigilant, keeping yards clear of debris where these ants might nest. The northern snakehead is a fish straight out of a sci-fi thriller. Native to Asia, it has sharp teeth, can breathe air, and even walk short distances on land using its fins. Once released into American waterways, snakeheads quickly establish themselves, eating anything from small fish to frogs and out-competing native species. Their ability to travel between bodies of water means they can colonize new areas with ease. To manage snakehead populations, states like Maryland have organized fishing tournaments, encouraging anglers to catch as many as possible. Officials have also used electrofishing to temporarily stun and remove them from affected waters. In some cases, poison baits are used to control their spread. Public awareness campaigns emphasize that anyone who catches a snakehead should never release it back into the water. Despite these efforts, snakeheads remain a persistent threat, and biologists are working to keep their numbers in check. European starlings introduced to the U.S. in the late 1800s have become one of the most invasive bird species. Legend has it that a Shakespeare enthusiast released starlings in New York's Central Park because they wanted America to have every bird mentioned in the bard's works. Unfortunately, these birds have wreaked havoc ever since. 
forming enormous flocks that devour crops and compete with native bird species for nesting sites. Farmers use various scare tactics to protect their crops, from loud noises and reflective objects to predatory bird calls. In some cases, population control measures like trapping and poisoning have been necessary. While these methods can be effective in the short term, starlings are adaptable and resilient, making long-term control difficult. Their story serves as a cautionary tale about the unintended consequences of introducing non-native species, even for something as noble as celebrating Shakespeare. House sparrows like starlings were brought to North America in the 1800s and have since spread across the continent. They are aggressive and often outcompete native birds for nesting sites, sometimes even evicting species like bluebirds and tree swallows. House sparrows are highly adaptable, thriving in both urban and rural environments, and their population has proven difficult to manage. Bird enthusiasts have developed special nest boxes designed to deter sparrows while protecting native species. Some people use sparrow spookers or trap and release methods to keep their numbers in check. Others take a more direct approach, using traps or even removing sparrow eggs to protect native birds. Despite these efforts, house sparrows remain a persistent nuisance, and bird lovers must be vigilant to ensure that native species have a fighting chance in the face of these feathered invaders. Japanese beetles are another invader that gardeners dread. These shiny metallic green insects feast on the leaves of roses, fruit trees, and other plants, skeletonizing foliage and causing extensive damage. Japanese beetles have a wide range of host plants, making them one of the most destructive pests in the United States. Control methods include hand-picking beetles off plants, setting up pheromone traps, and using natural insecticides like neem oil. Gardeners also deploy row covers to protect vulnerable plants. Biological controls such as introducing beneficial nematodes to the soil to attack beetle larvae have shown promise. However, Japanese beetles are resilient, and controlling them often requires a combination of methods. Gardeners across the country have had to adapt, using every trick in the book to keep these ravenous beetles at bay and protect their beloved plants from further devastation. Lastly, we have the Argentine ant an invasive species known for forming massive super colonies. These ants are relentless, often displacing native ant species and disrupting local ecosystems. Argentine ants can form colonies that stretch for miles, all working together in an ant army-like fashion. They've become a major pest in homes and gardens, making them a significant concern in the Southern United States. To control Argentine ants, homeowners use ant baits and insecticides. Scientists are researching biological control methods, such as deploying parasitic fungi that specifically target these ants. In some areas, barriers like diatomaceous earth are used to keep them out of homes. Despite these efforts, the super colonies keep expanding and researchers are racing to find more effective solutions. The fight against the Argentine ant is ongoing, but with continued innovation and public cooperation, there is hope for managing this persistent invader. And there you have it, 15 invasive species that have made themselves unwelcome guests across the United States, along with the unique and sometimes downright bizarre methods used to control them. From electric barriers and goat grazers to python hunting contests and snail sniffing dogs, the U.S. has pulled out all the stops to protect its ecosystems. It's a never-ending battle, but with creativity, determination, and a bit of humor, progress is being made. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to stay vigilant and do your part to prevent the spread of these invaders. Until next time, keep your gardens kudzu free, your waterways zebra mussel free, and your Everglades python free. Stay safe and take care.